So my son worked really, really hard on getting this miniature puzzle skull together. So I thought I would share you, with you some of the bones that you can see here just to give you perspective. There's a mouse sitting next to it. So it's really not a very large model. It's kind of nice to purchase this off of Amazon so it does have some information for us labeled. So there's the right and the left nasal bones. And this is a really nice um, image of the maxilla. So you can see that the maxilla actually runs up along the side of the nose, makes up part of the nose as well. Bridge our nasal bones. And then here's the paired maxilla. Between each of the teeth, there's a process, a little point or an indentation. Same thing is true on the mandible down low. So each one of those is what we call the alveolar process or the alveoli. The nasal septum, if I can zoom in here, the nasal septum is right there. It's that green structure that you're seeing. And so that's dividing the nasal passage into the left and the right side. So nasal septum is also on our list today. This model also shows the ethmoid bone. So the ethmoid bone is right back in here. It's a kind of a bluish color, definitely dim in there. And what's missing and is not pictured is a really tiny lacrimal bone. So what we should have right about here from this yellow down to about here is called the lacrimal bone. And this little indentation is the nasal lacrimal canal. And so it runs down the lacrimal bone and actually dumps into the nasal cavity here. So that would be the nasal lacrimal canal. You also, as I said, have those alveolar processes that are the ridges between each of the teeth. The teeth sit in what we call the alveolar socket. Other bones that we should be familiar with. So we have the zygomatic bone. It makes part of the arch that is our cheekbone. And we can also see from the side, this dark blue, this is from the lateral view, this is what we see of the sphenoid bone. You also have your frontal lobe, parietal lobe, and temporal lobe. And at the temporal lobe, if I rotate it up a little bit here, you see a hole. That hole is the external acoustic meatus. This bump is a process known as the mastoid process. And right here is a little projection down that's known as the styloid process. So all of those are features of the temporal bone. Um, for the mandible, it has some basic anatomy and I honestly, I can't remember what we said, so I'm gonna give you a few hints. So here's the body and the ramus. Right up here is a condyle that articulates with the temporal bone. You also will see a hole here. This is called the mental foramen. You also have foramen up here as well. And so these provide um, locations for nerves or blood vessels to travel in. So again, if we look at the lateral side on the opposite side, we're again seeing the zygomatic bone, body of the mandible, alveolar processes, the ramus, and then that condyle as well. The temporal bone is, for, is what the temporal muscle is named for. It also contributes to part of the arching of your cheek as well. And on this side, even though it's a different color, we still have that mastoid process. The tip of the thumb is the external acoustic meatus, and right there is the styloid process. If we look at the posterior of the skull, you get the occipital bone. And so that makes up the four big bones. So here is the lambdoid suture. It actually looks a little bit like the Greek um, lambda right here. So that's where that suture got its name. This one right here is the squamous suture. Oops, dropped him. And then right across the top is the coronal or frontal suture. Told you knowing that coronal plane would come in handle, handy. And this one follows the sagittal section, sagittal line. And so this is known as the sagittal suture. If we look at the inferior aspect of the skull, we're able to see palatine bones that make up the hard palate. You're getting a little bit of green here to represent that nasal septum, also known as the vomer. And then you see a bit of this kind of bluish colored sphenoid bone as well. So you can see the sphenoid bone from the inferior aspect. This is a very irregular shaped bone. Other features, the holes are not horribly prominent on this one, so I'm gonna kind of waylay on that. But here's your foramen magnum. This is where your spinal cord comes out. And then right here is a, a flat articulating surface and another one right here called the occipital condyles. Occipital for the bone, the occipital bone, and condyles, this is going to articulate with your vertebral column. 
Some of you have also asked what the occipital protuberance is. And so right here, right, if you're looking at the, the, the skull, right at the ba back of the skull, and you can almost see right here that it's pointing out. So that is the occipital protuberance right there. Other key terms that we need to know are inside the frontal bone. So I'm gonna open that up and then I'll show you the interior. Oh, poor Jimmy, he is just gonna cry when he sees what I did to his brain or to his skull anyways. So I've taken off the two parietal bones and left the occipital bone in place and the frontal bone in place. You can actually kind of see some of the cancellous bone um, modeling that they've incorporated as well. So looking at the interior of the skull, off of the, um, the occipital bone, we still have our large hole, the foramen magnum, and then right here and here, you're able to see jugular foramen as well. Remember our temporal bone was done in two different colors to represent the left side and right side of the patient. And right here, you'll see an indentation. And again on this one, right here is the indentation. These are the internal acoustic meatus. So your inner ear bones and your cochlea sit right here deep. And so your external acoustic meatus is where sound comes in, it gets transferred through some chambers to the cochlea, and then a nerve goes from the cochlea out this internal acoustic meatus to the brain. The other thing that we can see is the sphenoid bone. It looks like a sphinx moth, so I use that. So there's a moth called a sphinx, and so it has a kind of a butterfly pattern to it. And if you look deep, you will find an area called the cella tersica. So the cella tersica sits right here, and it's going to be a pocket that holds the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland hangs inferior off of the skull and sits in this particular location. The term cella tersica comes from the word Turkish saddle, so it looks like a little saddle for the pituitary to sit in. Other structures that you should be familiar with, right up here at the very front um, is the cribiform plate, and so that's going to be on the right and the left sides of the crystagalli, which is this ridge right here. The cribiform plate will have holes in it because this is where the op, uh, the not the optic nerve, it's silly Nicole. This is where the olfactory bulbs lay and sit in this region with their olfactory hairs hanging down into the nasal passage. So that then becomes sort of part of that sphenoid bone or, or that uh, ethmoid bone on the inside. So you can see the ethmoid bone up there for the crystagalli, the ridge right between the yellow that's in green, and then on either side, the cribriform plate, which is part of the ethmoid bone, which we could see as part of the eye socket, and then also we see in the nasal passage as well. If you look at the back of the eye socket, you should be able to see that the eye socket is a combination of six different bones, okay? So you have the frontal bone in the yellow, the uh, zygomatic bone, zygomatic bone in the purpley maroon. The blue is the sphenoid bone. And remember the sphenoid bone is very irregular in shape. The green is the ethmoid bone. And remember we're missing on the maxilla here, so the maxilla is that maroon color. We're missing a little tiny bone right there between the green and the purple. The hole right at the tip of my thumb is the nasal lacrimal canal. So there's actually a little lacrimal bone that sits right there as well, okay? The other thing that you'll find at the back of the eye cavity is a hole because that's where the optic nerve is going to come in and provide communication with the nervous system to each of the eyeballs. And so that then gives us a basic understanding of some general features, features of the skull.